Not only am I a lover of science, but I'm also very interested in the history of science. And so I wanted to do an occasional series on some of our most important scientific breakthroughs and discoveries. For the first in this series, I want to look at the speed of light, how we first measured it, and how we measure it today. Let's find out more. Before we start, let's look at what the speed of light actually is. It's 299,792,458 meters per second. That's 186,282.4 miles per second. This value has now been set and won't change. And it was actually set in 1983. The speed of light though, isn't just the speed of light. It's the speed of causality. It's the universe's ultimate speed limit. Objects and particles with mass are slowed down by that mass and so must travel at speeds slower than the speed of light. Massless things such as electromagnetic waves, of which visible light is just one type, are not slowed down by any mass and so are able to travel at this ultimate speed. We tend to think of the speed of light as incredibly fast, and it is. However, compared to the vastness of space, it's still quite slow. Light takes 1.255 seconds to travel from the moon to the Earth. This means that we see the moon as it was 1.255 seconds ago. Light takes 500 seconds to travel from the sun to here on Earth. If you imagine a photon of light setting off from the sun, now, the bottom of the screen will keep a track of its journey towards us. Even at these speeds, it takes years for light to reach us from even the nearest stars. So we can now measure the speed of light very accurately. But let's see how we got to this point. Firstly, let's go back to ancient history and the Greek philosopher Aristotle. He argued that light travelled instantly and therefore had an infinite speed. Empedocles, however, argued that since light moved, it must travel at a finite speed. In his emission theory, it was the eye that emitted light and that allowed vision. This idea was championed by a number of famous scientists, including Ptolemy and Euclid. However, Heron of Alexandria argued that the speed of light must be infinite, because when the eyes are opened, the stars can be seen instantly. Unfortunately, ancient Greek science was more of a deductive process, so rather than testing ideas, they thought that knowledge came from pure reasoning. In the 11th century, the Mesopotamian physicist Hassan ibn al-Haytham proposed a different idea called the intromission theory. In this, he proposed that light moves from an object to our eyes and must therefore travel at a finite speed. It wasn't until the 17th century that we get the first attempts at the measurement of a speed of light. In 1629, Dutch philosopher and scientist Isaac Beekman suggested an experiment involving an observer viewing the flash of a cannon reflected off a mirror. To conduct this experiment, he used a variety of mirrors placed at different distances from an observer and asked them to say if there was any difference between the times they saw the flash of light from the different mirrors. Not surprisingly, they didn't. Nine years later, Galileo claimed to have performed a version of this experiment a few years earlier, using the time taken to see the light from a lantern which lay several miles away as it was uncovered. The concept was relatively simple. He placed two observers on two different hills with a known distance between them. Observer 1 was to uncover their lantern and as soon as Observer 2 spotted the light, they were to uncover their lantern. Galileo used the time intervals between the two lamps being uncovered and the known distance to calculate the speed of light. Galileo stated that he wasn't able to detect whether light travelled instantly or not, but concluded that if light travel wasn't instantaneous, then it must be very fast indeed. Then, in 1667, the Accademia del Cimento in Florence said that they'd performed the experiment, with a lantern one mile away, and they reported that there was no delay in the time between the uncovering the lamp and it being observed. It wasn't until a further nine years later in 1676 that Ole Roma almost accidentally measured the speed of light for the first time. 
Obviously, because the speed of light is so fast, the technology didn't exist to make the accurate measurements that were needed here on Earth. However, Roma was observing astronomical phenomena, and it was the vast distances involved that allowed him to make the vital measurements. At the time, he was making measurements of the Jovian moon Io. It was known that Io completes one orbit of Jupiter in 42 and a half hours. Roma was trying to see if there was a way to use this orbital period as a kind of universal clock for navigation purposes. The time taken for Io to emerge from behind Jupiter should always be 42 and a half hours. But Roma found that as the Earth was moving away from Jupiter, each emergence took slightly longer than the previous one. So much so that Roma calculated that the difference in time between the emergence of Io when the Earth was the closest to Jupiter and when it was furthest away was 22 minutes. He actually got the value wrong. The actual time difference is 16 minutes and 40 seconds. Although Roma collected the data, he didn't actually calculate any speed for light. He sent a copy of his data to Christian Huygens, and it was he who calculated the speed of light to be 212,400 kilometers per second, or about 132,000 miles per second. He seemed to be less interested in the actual speed of light, but more that light had a finite speed. Edmund Halley would in 1694 calculate that light should take 17 minutes to cross the diameter of the Earth's orbit. Using this value, he calculated the speed of light to be 300,000 kilometers per second, 186,000 miles per second, very close to the actual value we have today. Then in 1729, James Bradley measured the speed of light again accidentally. He was trying to measure the stellar parallax of a star called Gamma Draconis. Stellar parallax is a method of measuring the distance to nearby stars. As the Earth orbits the Sun, nearby stars will shift their apparent positions against the background of stars slightly. And this allows us to measure their distance away from us. However, Bradley found that the positions of the stars didn't add up to what he was expecting. He realized that this was due to something called stellar aberration. This occurs because the light from the stars appears to come from a slightly different direction due to the movement of the Earth. Imagine it a little bit like this. Imagine you're outside on a rainy day and that the rain is falling straight downwards. If you now start walking, the rain will be coming at you at an angle. If you start running faster, the rain will come at you from more of an angle. And this is what happens to the light coming at us from the stars because of the movement of the Earth and the speed of light. Using some pretty nifty maths, Bradley was able to calculate the speed of light and the value he got was 301,000 kilometers per second. That's about half a percent out. We now come to 1849 and the experiment of Hippolyta Fizeau. In this experiment, he placed one telescope at Seren in Paris and another telescope at Montmartre, 8.3 kilometers away. These telescopes were pointed at each other. By one of the telescopes, he had a lamp and a wheel with teeth, a bit like a cogwheel. This wheel has 720 equally spaced teeth. The apparatus was set up so that the light passed through the gap in the teeth as it traveled out to the second telescope. The light then reflected off that telescope and traveled back to the first telescope and through the teeth of the wheel again before being observed through the telescope. As he spun the wheel, there came a point at which the light would travel out through the hole between two teeth and as the light traveled back, it hit the next tooth on the wheel. This meant that no light was observed. Fizeau found that at a speed of 12.6 revolutions per second, the light coming back from the telescope eight kilometers away was blocked by the next tooth. Using this information, he was able to calculate the speed of light and he calculated the speed of light to be 315,000 320 kilometers a second. That's an error of about 5%. This was, however, important because this was the first time of flight experiment used to obtain a value for the speed of light. In 1862, 
Leon Foucault used a similar experiment to try to determine the speed of light. Although he used a number of variations of this experiment over a period of time, the essence to this experiment is as follows. He used a source of light and a rotating mirror. As the light hits the mirror, it's reflected onto a further mirror. And as the light then bounces back from this second mirror, the rotating mirror has moved round a little bit. This means that the light will be reflected off this mirror, not towards the origin point of the light, but off at an angle. If you know how fast the mirror is spinning, and the angle that the light was reflected, you can work out the speed of light. This experiment was important, because it used much shorter distances than Fizeau's experiment. Foucault calculated a speed of light that was 298,000 kilometers per second. That's an error of just 0.6%. At around the same time, some scientists were working on electromagnetism. In 1856, Weber and Kohlrausch were calculating the electromagnetic and electrostatic forces. To do this, they discharged a Leyden jar. A Leyden jar is a piece of equipment that stores a high voltage electric charge. It consists of a glass jar with metal foil on both the inside and outside of the glass. A metal rod sticks up from the jar and a chain connects the rod to the metal foil inside the jar. The inner foil is charged by connecting it to an electrostatic generator, a bit like rubbing a comb back and forth on a piece of nylon cloth. The outer foil is also grounded, and the inner and outer foils now store equal but opposite charges. They calculated that the ratio between these two values was very close to the speed of light that Fizeau had calculated. In the 1860s, James Clark Maxwell was working to try to determine the speed of electromagnetic waves using experimental data. The value that he calculated for the speed of these waves was 310,740,000 meters per second. This he recognized as a speed of light and came to the correct conclusion that light is just another form of electromagnetic radiation, just like radio waves, microwaves, and UV rays. This then means that we can measure the speed of light without actually measuring the speed of light itself. In 1907, Rosa and Dorsey used this idea to determine the speed of light. They used values for the electric permittivity and magnetic permeability to determine a value for the speed of light, and the value that they got was 299,788 kilometers per second. A discussion about the speed of light wouldn't be complete without talk of Albert Michelson. He devoted much of his career to studying light and devised some inventive experiments to do so. In collaboration with Edward Morley, he conducted the famous Michelson-Morley experiment. This attempted to discover luminiferous ether. At the time, it was assumed that just as ripples on the surface of water, light waves had to have a medium with which to travel through and this was the luminiferous ether. Michelson and Morley measured the speed of light at right angles to determine if there was a difference that could be attributed to the ether. They found no difference in the speed of light in either direction. This experiment was the first strong evidence against the existence of the ether, and also the start of the path of discovery that led to the theory of relativity. Michelson also conducted a variation of Foucault's experiment using a vacuum tube one mile or 1.6 kilometers long and an eight-sided mirror. Through the use of other mirrors, he managed to make the light travel through five miles or about eight kilometers. This experiment came up with a value for the speed of light that was 299,796 kilometers per second. This was the most accurate time of flight experiment and it was accurate to 12 parts per million. These time of flight experiments attempt to time how long it takes light to move from an emitter to an observer. This usually involves the light being reflected off a surface and coming back to the observer. Even though these experiments are very important in the history of this discovery, they have accuracy problems, and so aren't the way that we actually measure the speed of light today. Variations on these experiments might be used in a college or university physics class as a teaching tool, but it isn't how it's actually done these days. 
The next method that was used to measure the speed of light is called cavity resonance. Because light is an electromagnetic wave, it behaves the same as other electromagnetic waves such as microwaves and radio waves. This means it has a wavelength and a frequency. The wavelength is the distance between two peaks and the frequency is the number of waves that occur per second. Frequency is measured in hertz, with one hertz being one wave per second. The speed of light can be calculated using the following formula. C, the speed of light, equals wavelength multiplied by frequency. In the late 1940s, Essen and Gordon Smith used this technique to measure the speed of light using a cavity resonator. This is a hollow metal tube. Microwaves generated in this tube will bounce around the tube in such a way that at specific frequencies, the number of wavelengths will be a whole number. If you can then measure the wavelength and the frequency of the waves, the equation can be used to measure the speed of light. Essen and Gordon Smith got a result of 299,792,500 meters per second, incredibly close to the accepted value today. You can actually do a variation of this experiment today in your own home, if you have a microwave oven. Though I accept no responsibility for any damage that may occur as a result. Remove the turntable so that the food doesn't spin. This is very important. Then take a plate and cover it in chocolate or American style cheese slices. Put the plate in the microwave and switch on. The chocolate will start to melt at the antinodes of the wave. This is the highest and lowest points of the wave and this is half a wavelength. Measure the distance between two melty bits and multiply by two to find the wavelength. On the back of the microwave it should give a value for the frequency. Multiply the two numbers together and you've now found the speed of light. Well done. Next we get on to interferometry. Firstly this was done using radio waves in 1958 by Froome, but with the invention of lasers a more accurate method was used by Evanson and his colleagues in 1972. But the basic premise is the same for both. If I take an electromagnetic wave of a known frequency, a laser beam for instance, if I then shoot this at a half silvered mirror that splits the beam in two at 90 degrees to each other, each subsequent beam will then travel out to a mirror and be reflected back. If both beams travel exactly the same distance and return to the same point, the beams as they converge will undergo constructive interference, where the peaks coincide, as do the troughs. If I move one of the mirrors back a certain distance, the waves will then undergo destructive interference. The peaks of one wave will coincide with the troughs of the other wave and cancel each other out. By doing this, the wavelength of the electromagnetic wave or laser light can be very accurately measured and using our equation again, we can use that to calculate the speed of light. In 1972, Evanson calculated a value for the speed of light to be 299,792,456 meters per second. That's just two meters per second different than the now accepted value, which is set at 299,792,456. Four hundred and fifty-eight meters per second. And this brings us to the end of our little journey through space and time. You find me here on Mars, just enjoying the view and relaxing. If you enjoy my voyages of discovery, then please consider subscribing, and we can go on more journeys together. But for now, and until next time, thank you for watching.